And in bowling, uh, she moved things to a new place. Uh, she still did not think structurally. It's like she did not spend enough time thinking, well, uh, why is it that Aries men and Aphrodite women tend to pair up so much? What are the structural underpinnings of that? Because in these traditional mythologies, um, the polarity issue is key everywhere. Everybody, everybody's aware of polarity in these traditional mythologies. And so if I were to uh, have said that where Jean needed to take her work forward, it would have been more comparative studies so that she could get more of a sense for the relationship between these gods and goddesses. These gods and goddesses are not discrete and unrelated. She knows there's a family of the gods, but in my view, there's a lot more structure to the family of the gods than Jean, at the time she was writing that, seemed to want to lift up. And so, uh, so uh, all of these people were pioneers in uh, the uh, study of mythology in relationship to the psyche and its structure, and they've all uh, given us foundations to stand upon. Uh, but the challenge that we, uh, if we want to be neo-Jungians and not cultic Jungians, the challenge is to try to increase our scanning with our uh, psychoanalytic Hubble telescope of inner space and increase our scanning, scan wider sectors and try to get some sense about the relationships between um, mythic images in one cultural setting with mythic images in others and then start writing those projections backwards to try to ask with Jung, okay, what's this got to do with the, uh, with the actual structure of this two million year old self? And then what does that have to do with why things are falling apart so much? both in my personality uh, and in the society. So let me open it up before we got about five minutes before we break. Uh, uh, any comments or questions on uh, these forerunners in, uh, in the study of myth and psyche is our foundation for uh, looking at Dumasil. Yeah, Bill. Sort of at the heart of some aspects in terms of what you're saying about Jung and Campbell is this, the issue of the nature versus nurture debate. Yeah, yeah. And I think PC-wise now, people want to think that it is nurtured, that in essence we are born with a blank slate in our hands, the top of us. Right. And of course, you and Campbell Iliadi, um, they take very much the other approach, that it's, it is, that it's not one versus the other, it's not nature right. or right. a nurture, it's nature and nurture that produces who and what we are in our societies. And right. The, and that shapes our struggle. These deep structures, structures we are born with, mm -hmm. not a blank slate. And so I think that just goes right down the line in terms of being the underlying basic assumption, are we blank slate or not? Right. Yeah, and uh, uh, Bill was pointing out the uh, nature-nurture controversy that's under some of these uh, uh, different struggles uh, amongst students of mythology and interpreting mythology because the nature-nurture issues do reach down. Because see, if you buy that, if you buy that there are deep structures, uh, then you have to study them if you're going to be free, if you're going to be liberated. What happens is people think, and that it's really amazing how quick people move and how they don't reflect very much. And they think, you know, if there are deep structures, I'm totally at their mercy. Therefore, uh, if I believe in them, then I believe in the tyranny of the instincts. That's a very popular idea in the academic world today, and in the theological world, religious world. Well, you know, a Jungian doesn't think that way. A Jungian doesn't say, well, if I have shadow, I'm totally helpless. And the way to deal with my shadow is just to declare it doesn't exist. That's not a Jungian attitude. A Jungian view of, you got to always ask people when they're arguing with you about these things, what is your theory of change? Because everybody's got a theory of change, whether they know it or not. How does change occur? A Jungian, a classical, anything that, a Jungian point of view that's recognizably Jungian, does not assume you change by denying influences on you. 
from the unconscious or from anywhere else. It assumes that the way you change is to begin to acknowledge the forces which are extremely difficult to deal with in your life that you're not conscious of, not, not aware of, and that the way to deal, for example, with my aggression, my, my acting out aggressively or violently, is not to pretend I have no aggression. Uh, or pretend if I have it, I simply there because I got abused as a child. See, which is typical. In fact, it's one of the things I don't like about Kohut and the Kohutian tradition. They, they like to think that, you know, well, there's not any aggression in there unless, unless it's reactive. See, this is where they didn't improve on Freud, because Freud knew there was aggression in there. And, and it didn't get there simply because father abused you or mother abused you or somebody else. Aggression is in there. It's a... It's hardwired. The question is not, do I have it? The question is, how do I use it? And so uh, a Jungian approach to transformation and individuation and maturation says we got to know what we're struggling with, even if it's not pretty. In other words, we know that we are 99%, or around 99%, the same genetically as chimpanzees. Does that have any influence on our behavior? You know, a lot of people say, oh, no. And they don't argue that we're 98% plus the same genetically as chimpanzees. They don't deny that because there's too much evidence that that's true. Scientific evidence that that's true. But don't you find it amazing? The vast numbers of otherwise supposedly intelligent people that will say, this doesn't really have a bearing on my behavior or on my psyche. Those chimpanzees are not human. We can do with them what we want to do in animal experimentation. They don't feel pain, you know. There's no moral issues about experimentation on chimpanzees. Because they're not like me. Well, here's the news, to the, the, the bad news for our grandiosity. The increasing evidence is they are very much like us. I'll be teaching a workshop, one-day workshop this spring on... Uh, uh, predatory masculine behavior looking at the new book, the recent book called Demonic Males which is a reflection on this evidence uh, so in any case uh, uh, a Jungian point of view does not assume that if you don't use the word warrior you will not have aggression and you would be amazed at how many people for example in the churches think you should take all warrior language out of hymns because to have warrior language is to make you irresponsible in the use of your aggression. Think about what kind of theory of change that is. That's like if I stick my head in the sand, it makes me more in control. <laughs> anyway, any other comments or questions? We got a, a minute or two. Say the title again. The Patterned Language. The Patterned Language. Yes. A and book the, called The Patterned Language. And, uh, it's, uh, a book of heuristics for architects hmm. and uh, there's actually uh, some pretty compelling arguments in terms of uh, composing buildings that there are actually patterns that must be adhered to hmm. so I just this is a book on uh, on architecture which some architects are using to think about the relationship, I, I suspect, the relationship between the human experience of space and certain fundamental cognitive givens. And, right. Uh, one of the, the uh, points that comes out of the book is that uh, there's a lot of fallacy in um, uh, modernism of uh, architecture. Yes. We've gone through a period in architecture when, uh, when uh, folks thought they could, didn't have to think about human beings too much when they were building buildings, you know. And so, happily, according to what Steve is saying, that people are beginning to come back and realize that we really are specific as a species. For example, we're now beginning to be more and more aware. Uh, in fact, it's been very fascinating to me. People are beginning to realize that growing up without trees may be a problem for our species. You know, they're actually, they're actually talking about this in terms of city planning. They're actually beginning to say, well, now, could there be a relationship between teenage violence and the fact that, for example, here in Chicago, there are not very many trees on the west side? It's related to what Steve is talking about. It's like uh, uh, 
if you begin to think about this particular species that we are and, and in terms of our fundamental structures, we've been pretty much the same for quite some time now. Thousands of years. Yeah. Now, now high rises have been long, long known as one of the great uh, failures of modern architecture. Yes. And uh, there was a, a very famous project called Pru Igo Project in St. Louis that the government finally had to demolish because uh, human behavior of the people that lived there was just uh, disastrous. Right. He is speaking about the realization increasingly that the uh, the human warehousing we did in high rises in the cities. Uh, a lot of people are realizing now those need to come down. So th th this would be related to the issue that that human being is not infinitely plastic. That there are some things. It's not that we are totally determined by our instinctual and inherited given, but that we make terrible mistakes when we totally ignore it as the context for our ethical and maturational agendas, that we have to start where we are. And uh, we'll come back to that, uh, certainly. We'll talk about that a lot tomorrow. Um, but thank you very much for that. Let's take our break now, and uh, let's take an hour break, and let's try to start uh, as close to an hour from now as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, after these folks in the, the San Francisco Young Institute Library Journal pointed out that uh, that my work seemed to have parallels to Doomsday, uh, I, I saw I need to find I said to myself I need to find somebody that's an expert on this to teach me about this and find out why this is related to my work. So I was on a trip in South America, uh, sitting in a a little uh, restaurant, sitting with one of the gentlemen on this trip. And uh, he and I were talking about our work, and this guy was a Byzantine scholar, uh, had been a Byzantine scholar. And, and I said, uh, do you know anything about Doomsdale? I said, uh, you know, I, the challenge facing me now is I've got to find out about Doomsdale. And uh, uh, this gentleman's name is Dr. Dean Miller, who is a very, very uh, outstanding uh, Byzantine scholar. But it turns out, as he responds to me at that table, he says, well, I've studied Doomsdale. So I'm sitting in South America somewhere yeah, at, a, at a restaurant with a guy on the, the, the trip that I'm on through South America, my wife and I are on. It turns out I'm sitting with a very, very knowledgeable Dumasilian scholar who lives here in Chicago, who uh, Dean has been extremely gracious to me and patient, I would say patient, uh, kind of going over the basics of this stuff with me to try to help me kind of get it in my head. And he's also a friend of Scott Littleton, who is this leading scholar that the book that I recommended this uh, this uh, the new comparative mythology uh, by C. Scott Littleton uh, and uh, we're indebted to both of these men for these handouts uh, I would not have them if it were not for the generosity of Scott Littleton and uh, Dean Miller uh, but to say the least uh, Scott Littleton has been the chief American uh, person who has been uh, bringing attention to the to the theories of Dumasil uh, and uh, we'll be looking at these handouts in just as soon as I can get this orientation and, and uh, 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 of the basic function of the, of the functions themselves out. And we'll look at the way the gods tend to to be parsed out over this. Uh, <clears throat> it is very interesting uh, to realize that someone can be an extremely voluminous scholar. One of the things I want you to do when you look at these books and look at the bibliography in, uh, in Littleton's book is see the enormity of the body of research that exists. The interesting thing about it is that only about 10% of this has been translated into English. And so uh, the fact that it was published first in French uh, uh, has been a uh, problem about getting knowledge about these theories into the, uh, into the English-speaking world. Uh, and as you may or may not know, Jungian psychology is practically non-existent in France, comparatively speaking. That is, there Freud's tradition, the Lacanian thought, is fairly uh, uh, Lacan and other uh, French uh, Freudian schools are, is very very dominant. There are some French Jungians, but they don't have very much of a powerful presence there intellectually uh, yet. Uh, in any case. Uh, uh, a lot of the work uh, that Dumasil did was at the Sorbonne in, in France, and uh, he was uh, a uh, prominent scholar and director of studies in the uh, in the uh, the area of the science of religions, what they call the science of religions, um, uh, 
uh, there. Uh, to give you a little context about this, one one thing you got to get clear in your mind at this point: uh, Dumasil is not a Jungian, and uh, as you'll see in just a few minutes, the assumptions that he has are vastly different. That he has are vastly different uh, from uh, Jung's or mine, or uh, and about what we're looking at here. Uh, and you'll see that as we go, uh, the 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 way in which uh, this theory is framed uh, is is not at all. Um, a part of the tradition that we were talking about earlier. Dumasio was influenced by the sociology of uh, two great French sociologists. Uh, and here again, I'm deeply indebted uh, for these introductory comments uh, to the, the incredible uh, book by Scott Littleton. Uh, uh, Emile Durkheim, who was, of course, the great French sociologist that wrote the book, the pathfinding book, uh, Elementary Forms of... Uh, the religious life, um, which I talked about in the last workshop, I believe, in terms of idealization dynamics. And also, uh, another French sociologist that I've been interested in, uh, Marcel Mauss, who, uh, who has been one of the persons uh, who, in uh, sociology, did the most work with, uh, uh, with uh, studies of sacrifice and uh, the, uh, the whole group of issues relating to the, the rituals of sacrifice and behaviors around sacrifice in human culture. Uh, uh, so he, he was heavily influenced by these early French uh, sociologists. And what he was really focusing on, though, was not sociology in general or developing a, a uh, sort of a universal sociological theory. What he was really interested in was the, uh, the myths, the epics, the rituals, and the folk tales of uh, what has been called the ancient uh, Indo-European peoples uh, of the world. And uh, uh, the impact of his studies uh, in this area uh, was for many years extremely profound. I mean, he has had, uh, uh, by, the, by the 1960s, when, uh, when uh, Lilton wrote the first edition uh, of this book, when this the first edition of this came, this is the third edition. But when the first edition came out, uh, there had been a tremendous impact on scholarship uh, among scholars uh, who focus on these Indo-European traditions. Now, we'll talk a little bit uh, in a minute about just what we're talking about when we say Indo Indo-European. Uh, but in any way, the, the important thing for us to realize is that that this tradition of scholarship was almost totally ignored by British. And American uh, 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 scholarship for many years, and uh, uh, in spite of the fact that there was this incredible uh, amount of stuff coming out, as you look in the bibliographies in these books to see, and uh, <clears throat> so in any case, uh, we can uh, we can say that uh, Dumasil began to be identified with, by some, with structuralism as a school of thought. Uh, and we will see, I mean, in a minute, that I think that's really a, a misplaced designation. Uh, he was interested in the function of different functions in society. Uh, influenced by Durkheim, uh, he uh, tended with Durkheim to view myths and rituals and so forth as collective representations of social phenomena. That is to say, if you want to understand what the gods are about the, the gods and goddesses and myths. What you're going to have to do is do a sociological analysis of uh, of the way society's organized. If you remember back when we were talking about these idealized projections of the gods, uh, the last workshop we did. So uh, he's in that Durkheimian tradition, and uh, he's thinking about um, the the social system, and he's thinking about the way in which these different gods represent aspects of the social system. So in that, in that respect, he's right in that Durkheimian tradition. What was unusual, however, is uh, uh, his coming up with this theory of tripartition, the, uh, the three-function theory, which uh, he began to uh, put forth as a, a, a structural and dynamic breakdown of Indo-European social organization and ideology. So now right from the start, look here what he's saying. He's not talking about the psyche. 
he is uh, he's talking about uh, structures and dynamics and social organization and their collective representations in myths and rituals and uh, values and so on. Uh, he's been uh, he's been called a functionalist, but uh, as Littleton points out, uh, when he says function, he's not talking about it like functionalist sociologist. He's he's simply talking about a certain uh, cluster of values and behaviors and agendas that are representative of what he calls the the functions, we'll, which we'll outline in a minute. Uh, he was primarily interested in Indo-European culture, and so he was arguing that uh, that there is a primordial source actually to many of the cultures that Jungians have studied uh, with interest in recent years that uh, prior to Indian culture not Native American but uh, but uh, Asian Indian culture prior to Roman culture prior to Hittite culture prior to Celtic culture and so on Roman and Greek and so on there was a what is known as a proto-Indo-European social organization which has through various uh, uh, channels been passed down into those distinct we think of them as distinct cultures the impact of of uh, Dumazil's work was to raise the question and you can see why he would not be popular today because he is pressing the agenda what is common between the Celts, the Romans, the, the Hindus, the Hittites, and so on. Uh, but in those days, um, um, the different the linguistic traditions and the different scholar, the scholars of language, the scholars of sociology, the scholars of anthropology, and so on, uh, they were ripe for somebody coming up with, a, with a, an interpretive theory. And, uh, and his challenge to them, uh, presenting this theory, uh, turned out to be extremely influential and generated enormous amounts of attempts to disprove him, you know, to argue with him, to disprove him, to find examples for his disciples, to find examples of how his tripartite theory was accurate, and by his enemies to say, no, 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 uh, as we'll see in a minute, uh, this tripartite theory, that's not really tripartite, there are really four, not three, or uh, this is not just Indo-European, it applies to other people, or, and so on. But, uh, but needless to say, uh, a powerful theory will often generate a lot of research. And, and this is true in all forms of science. You will not find a scientific theory that is not disputed. I mean, uh, um, it, 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 only recently, for example, uh, uh, this, uh, this man that had done so much work on crater formation and uh, arguing that there have been asteroid impacts on Earth the whole scientific community, huge numbers of percentages of the scientific community thought he was just a complete flake. And uh, um, it was Eugene Shoemaker, and he, uh, he discovered this Shoemaker-Levy comet, and then his theories got proven when the comet, when the, uh, comet hit uh, Jupiter. And, uh, I mean, it's amazing how things change in science, but one of the characteristics are theories don't eliminate debate usually. They create a lot of debate, which furthers a lot of research and scholarship, and that's what happened with Dumazil's uh, uh, early presentation of his theories. What was his fundamental sense of tripartition? He was arguing that underlying these uh, cultures that he believed were derivative of Indo-European so uh, Indo society, that there, were, there was a tripartite social uh, and ideological division, and it was divided into these three things, sovereignty, force and fertility that this threefold ideology was primordial in this proto-indo-european culture and that it was reflected not only in social structure that you had a a social class or a caste that carried sovereignty functions we'll look at these charts in a minute you had a social class or caste that carried uh, military or warrior functions and that you had a social caste or class that carried the role of cultivators or fertility functions and that if you looked these are these this was the way society was structured 
collective representations in myths and rituals were projected out and became their mythic pantheons. And so um, the, the myths of the society reflected this particular ideology, according to Dumasil. Now understand here, see, this is why I say Dumasil is not really a structuralist, because he, Dumasil is not arguing that this tripartite ideology and three functions apply to all human beings. If he were truly a structuralist, in the way that I mean structuralism, or the way that Claude Levi-Strauss would be talking about structuralism, or Piaget would be talking about structuralism, or the Jungian uh, point of view in terms of deep structures, you would be arguing that these three functions apply to all human beings. That's not what Dumasil was arguing. In fact, a lot of the attacks on Dumasil uh, bring evidence that this is present in other cultures and not just Indo-European cultures. See? So, uh, so uh, uh, this is, in other words, a kind of a regional argument. These human beings descended from this particular family of tribes had this kind of social organization and this division of the gods. And uh, <clears throat> when I first looked at this, when I saw this tripartite division, all this emphasis on the three functions, I thought, how in the world could anybody have thought that this is the same as my work? Because everybody that looks at my work knows that I'm talking about fours. And then my uh, friends pointed out to me, well, yeah, but, but the first function is really dual. It's not really just one. There are two forms of sovereignty. Well, what are those forms of sovereignty? Well, first is juridical. We associate that with the king. It is the upholder of contracts and right ordering. The second aspect of dual sovereignty is the magico-religious aspect of sovereignty. What does that have to do with? Not with external ordering or social ordering predominantly, but with transactions with the magical forces and powers uh, having to do with a priestly function. Uh, so these are the people that relate to the numinous knowledge whose contribution to sovereignty is the connection to the great powers, to the great magic. And so uh, then I could see where they saw the connection with my theory because, uh, and also for the first time, I saw as clearly as, as uh, one needs to see the way in which uh, indeed, and we'll see tomorrow, uh, any kind of adequate sovereignty does have to be dual. Um, and we will, we will get into that more later. So in any case, um, gods in this uh, system gods and goddesses then according to Dumasil uh, can be plotted in terms of these functions including in terms of one or the other pole of the sovereignty function and uh, <clears throat> so if you'll look with me at these charts the uh, the one that says figure three and the one with Scott Littleton's name are both uh, from uh, from Scott's teaching materials, uh, Littleton's teaching materials. The one that has a tripartite division of labor at the top is from a book edited by Morris Silver called Ancient Economy in Mythology East and West. And the title of the article that this is from, it's this one here, it says tripartite division of labor at the top. The article that this is from is called The Tripartite Division of Labor, Priests, Warriors, and Cultivators in Ancient Indo-European Mythology. So, <clears throat> so this, uh, this thing that has the Dumasilian paradigm, this has to do, this will show you there in terms of the social, first the social organization. Uh, and this is dealing with Indian culture, if you'll notice on the left column at the top. The, uh, the first function uh, represented by the Brahmins, the priestly caste there. The, uh, the uh, first aspect of sovereignty represented by the god Mitra. That's the juridical part. The second aspect of sovereignty 
the more frightening magical aspect of sovereignty is represented by the god Varuna. Uh, on the second function, the social uh, class in, uh, in that culture, the Kshatriyas, the warrior caste, the, uh, the god that is associated with this warrior function uh, uh, in its positive form is Indra. Indra is the god, you know, if you, if, even if you study Tibetan Buddhism, for example, you know that Vajra, have you ever seen the Vajras in Tibetan Buddhism, the little, the little thunderbolt image that's held in the hand and directed and used during prayers? Well, the Vajra, the thunderbolt, uh, came directly out of this tradition. I mean, even in Tibetan Buddhism, it comes directly out of this tradition of Indra, Indra and his thunderbolts. Uh, so the war against evil, uh, the, the great divine warrior who makes war against evil and the monsters is Indra. And then the third uh, function, the uh, fertility function, uh, you know, the social caste is Vaishas, and uh, uh, a variety of uh, goddesses, gods and goddesses that uh, are listed there, particularly the, the goddess Sarasvati. Uh, is uh, primary expression. But now look at uh, the interesting thing then though is to look at the plotting of gods and goddesses from the different cultures uh, issuing from this according to these theorists from this Indo-European base. So if you go from left to right you'll see the parallels that um, that these that Dumazil and other Dumazilian scholars have uh, have noted in Roman culture, Scandinavian culture, Scythian culture, Greek culture, Iranian culture, Celtic culture, and somewhat in Slavic culture. Uh, now this is this is an example here, and then you can look at these 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 others as we go. This is why they talked about the new comparative mythology because his theory of the three functions began to press scholars to ask the question about the relationships between gods and goddesses cross-culturally in terms of their role in the pantheon of the gods now you see you think back now to what we were talking about this morning about Jean Bolin she had some sense of the roles of the goddesses and the gods in the pantheon, right? What she did not have was anything remotely approaching this kind of analysis. Where rather than just being uh, completely arbitrary in terms of your, your looking at different gods or goddesses to illustrate Jungian archetypes and so on and so forth, you begin to look at terms of the qualities of the gods and to see if particular gods or goddesses have particular responsibilities, particular gifts, particular role to make a contribution in a particular area, a particular function. Uh, so let's look at these other, these other charts and you can spend some time between now and tomorrow uh, perusing these. Look at the figure three, tripartition in the pantheon. Focus here on India, Iran, Rome, Germanic traditions, and the Celts. And here you here you have the same thing again. One of the fascinating things to me, look down at figure two under the social tripartition and under the, uh, the uh, images associated with the different functions. Look to the right of that column on figure two under the Scythians. The image of the cup, the battle axe, and the plow. When I was uh, doing the work that I'll be talking about tomorrow morning, I began to realize that there were images that represented these different functions and that these images would come up in, uh, in uh, uh, mythic images. Uh, I focused on the sword. The battle axe is a version of the sword. It is a second function image, the battle axe. The cup is a priestly image having to do with magical authority. Uh, people who have uh, tried to find an image relating to the magician, they usually, usually choose either the wand or the cup for, for the magician. 
And the plow or yoke has to do with the fertility uh, function uh, in these traditions. You can ask, where is the scepter? That's what I would ask. Where is the scepter? And we want to get in uh, tomorrow when we're looking at uh, uh, trying to challenge the way this thing is formulated uh, about certain subtleties and complexities in the, in the issue of sovereignty that are not, that are not clear here. Battle axe is like a sword. It's something you kill people with. It's something you express aggression with. Uh, I just went to see the movie last night, Oscar and Lucinda. I don't know whether you know about that Australian movie, but it's really a very, very fascinating movie. And the, the axe is used for uh, for uh, a killing in there. I mean, it's a very clear uh, image of the... It was an axe against a sword in this particular story. Um... Uh, so if you'll just peruse that, you'll get a sense. There's no one-to-one. -one. one of the things we want to think about is uh, why are they not all the same, see? And uh, uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about this in terms of individual psychology, you know. Uh, you know, uh, if there are uh, these archetypal energies that have to be balanced, why aren't they the same in everyone? Why aren't they presented the same way? The issue with relationship to cultures is very similar to the issue with relationship to families religions, spiritualities, and personalities. But that's anticipating us. So in any case, what is new about the new comparative mythology? Well, unlike these folks that are coming out of a Jungian tradition, they're not, in this tradition, they're not looking at something that would apply to everyone. They're not looking at cognitive deep structures. The, the, this, in this tradition, they're thinking this is, this is really Indo-European. Uh, it's kind of fun to think about, those of you that have studied this Indo-European stuff more than I have, be, it's fun to think about uh, all these fantasies about this primordial culture back there, uh, allegedly behind these different uh, cultures. You see, if you, if you buy this kind of theory that Dumazil and these folks are pushing, they're really fundamentally uh, diffusionist. They, they are not following a Campbell-like uh, approach or an Iliadi-like approach. Uh, they don't. They don't see this stuff as, as coming from some primordial source, equally into all uh, traditions, and just being manifest somewhat differently. Uh, this is really a historical argument. They're arguing about historical influences, uh, and the, the, a lot of their arguments have to do with, well, if this is really in, influenced by Indo-European ideology, how did it get here? And uh, if it was influenced, if the Norwegians were influenced by Indo-European ideology. Why did they not have more of this representation of this particular function and, and not uh, so much of this one? Uh, and so, so uh, uh, when we're talking about this particular tradition of scholarship, it is, a, it is what I would call a regional hermeneutics. It's, uh, you know, it is not a general theory of interpretation. It's a regional one. It has to do with a particular uh, social and cultural and historical background from their point of view. Uh, now, that said, it is really incredibly fascinating. Now, what is fascinating and uh, uh, enormously interesting to me as a researcher is the amount of incredibly careful comparative work that's been done between these traditions that are on these sheets. Jungian researchers, for the most part, uh, have uh, steered away from any careful studies of comparison and contrast, say, between Celtic traditions and Indian traditions, or Celtic traditions and Roman traditions. Uh, there's been such a, uh, a Johnny one-note uh, attitude among Jungians to, to privilege the Greek tradition in their studies of archetypal forms. Nothing wrong with studying Greek uh, traditions, but, if, but in my view, if we're going to study Greek traditions, we need to draw on these folks, the people that have done the most careful study of Greek tradition, qua Greek tradition, uh, are, are the scholars in this tradition. Because if you're a Jungian and you just want to study archetypal dimensions of Greek tradition, this body of scholarship uh, would carry our discussions forward simply on that. But in terms of uh, what we have needed for a long time and, and getting off of the bottom rung of the ladder, ladder in archetypal studies is serious comparative work between Celts, Romans, Greeks, uh, Hindus, and so on, Buddhists. So, so uh, 
the existing research is just this incredibly rich thicket of, uh, of data uh, for one who would study any of these particular uh, traditions that you see listed here, uh, Zoroastrian and so on, uh, for Jungian purposes. So, uh, so if we didn't do anything else other than uh, encourage our researchers to get into this literature to test what, uh, for example, Gene Bolin has said about these Greek gods and goddesses, is what she has said about the Greek gods and goddesses, uh, is it borne out by the people that have spent their entire lives uh, studying these particular gods and goddesses in terms of their particular form and function. <clears throat> Another thing that has come up out of this, uh, out of Dumasil's research is the observation, which I also noted when I was uh, finding uh, Bolin's work uh, somewhat problematic, is that, you know, some gods and goddesses don't parse out into one or the other of the functions. Uh, if you're studying gods and goddesses as sources for archetypal information and reflection, often you will find a god or goddess that will be have more than more than one function. Sometimes all three functions. So what are we to make of that? Now, some of the scholars have said, see Dumazil says, there are these gods and goddesses which have the role of presenting the integration of the functions. And he says that in rituals, you would have prayers to those gods before you had prayers to the separate functions, the ritual, the, the gods of the, sever, of the separate functions. And then before you would close your ritual, you would have prayers to the integrating gods after you had um, prayers to the separate function, functional gods. You see, think about that now. Think about that. Tomorrow we'll think about that in depth, the psychology of that. Uh, but in any case, when I was uh, looking at this stuff early on, I, thought, I kept saying, well, gee, you know, I mean, Zeus, if you study Zeus, Zeus manifests, you know, I didn't know about this stuff then. I said, but, you know, Zeus is a lover. Zeus is a warrior. Zeus is a king. So, how does it help you to get clear about archetypal energies to talk about Zeus? Uh, and so I did not realize that there had been all these scholars uh, working for ages now, for years and years and years, on trying to understand that. I mean, uh, the fact that as things develop, there tends to become an, a bridging of the functions. Now think about that. Tomorrow we're going to think about that psychologically. As things develop... When society becomes more integrated, individual functions begin to be bridged. And tomorrow we'll see that that's also true of the self, the functioning of the self. But uh, in terms of Dumasil's research, he just observed it. There are these gods and goddesses that are primarily representations of integration of the functions. And so... Uh, so uh, something that has been confusing about using gods and goddesses to express archetypal energies uh, has been getting a lot of attention. Okay, now let's, let's open it up for comments and questions about the... Yes, go ahead. And we'll just uh, kick this around a little bit first, and then we will turn later to the... Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm looking at Table 5.1, and I was looking this over before you began to speak when I was seeing light and dark and connected. Oh, yes with gods that I'm somewhat familiar with. Yeah. I thought, well, light, dark, that's positive, negative, maybe even the active and passive poles of the various schemes mm -hmm. that you have in your books. Um, and in the second and third functions, it seems as though that there is a, a light and a dark side to those particular elements in culture. But under the first one, the light and the dark seem to separate into two totally different uh, yeah. totally different, but yeah, I noticed that significantly too. different functions. I yeah, I noticed that too. Unless that means yeah, and this is this is the kind of thing that I want us to really think about in some in some depth tomorrow. But but I, I I'll take a shot at it here. It's like, uh, you know, when I have talked about these archetypal energies, one of the things that's confused people is that I have emphasized that that warrior energy is neither good nor bad. That it has a shadow aspect and a positive aspect, and that in any particular personality, it's never going to be. The manifestation of that energy is never going to be wholly healthy. And so uh, 
With regard to the second and third functions that you're talking about here, uh, I was talking to uh, Dr. Miller about this, and he says that that if you really get into this literature, that that these traditions are enormously aware of what what I would call the shadow sides of the gods. That is, that uh, there are tremendously destructive expressions uh, of these deities that you will find, and uh, and so in one sense, in in this literature. Uh, Dark will often refer to those really destructive aspects, for example, of the hero uh, or of the king. And uh, and uh, but I think that that's what's confusing too to me because up there in that first function, they're using dark in a different way. It's a, almost like a shifting of metaphors the way they are using that. I think you're picking up on a, on a way they've really shifted the usage of that metaphor because they're saying dark there. It means more like, well, I can relate to. Uh, I can relate to the king well enough because he's dealing with laws and, and you know if I don't do this I get killed but if I do do this I'll be all right but when you deal with the the high priest there are forces that are quote dark forces not meaning bad forces but they're hidden they're esoteric forces they are forces that you can't just approach uh, naively and directly uh, you have to have a priest or you have to have a master you have to have someone to be your initiator. And so I think you're pointing to a kind of a shifting of the use of that word dark. Both senses of it exist. Uh, and we'll see when we talk later about the war of the functions. Uh, uh, there's this place when the so-called dark force of the magical aspects of the king, or of the uh, sovereignty function, magically casts a spell on everybody to stop their fighting. See, everybody's fighting. And then this dark aspect of sovereignty goes, and everybody has got a spell, and it stops the fight. Well, think about family therapy. I mean, <laughs> or, or think about time out when you're when you're obsessing about your complexes. Uh, and it's about getting into that magician space, which is which is to to get out of this conflict for a minute, to contemplation. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, don't tend to associate contemplation with esoteric energies in the modern world. But in fact, in the rest of history, the rest of human beings always did. The way you get in touch with esoteric energies is fasting and contemplation. Then you start experiencing the cities, the forces, the mana power. You follow that? So I think you're absolutely right about that kind of waffling there in the use of, of dark. Uh, in Milton's book, because on page 65 of it, when I was reading it, he's referring to Varuna, uh, this, this first function magician, says that he... Uh, the second part of the first function, right, right. Varuna. Milton says he's apt to behave irrationally and not always in a manner beneficial to his devotees, achieving his end through the exercise of his constant magical powers. He generally presents himself as an awesome and rather terrible being. So immediately I write in the, in the margin of shadow. Right. But then four or five sentences later, he basically presents then the positive side, yes. saying that he's responsible for the maintenance of proper magical religious beliefs. So right. it says Now you see if you do not if you do not have my theory, then this is harder to sort out. But for example, whenever you deal with an er, a human shaman, and there are a lot of real human shamans, when you deal with a real human shaman, there is always the charlatan side of the shaman who will abuse his magical potency. And it would be hard to find one in which that's not true of. However, to demonize shamans, because they have that first part, is to totally miss the point. These folks are the technicians of the sacred. And the shamans, the, the ones that I think are real shamans, that I know, uh, have this dual light and dark, dark, light and dark aspect of that particular magical power. And so uh, if, you, if you got a sense of the shadow, and as Jung says, there is nothing that doesn't have a shadow. Then you know all these gods and goddesses have shadow expressions, which is that second part of the dark. And the first part of the dark is just the fact that you can't, it's like, the, the when he discusses that in the first function there, it's like you can't come at this magical energy with your left brain. Or if you do, you'll just be confused. It's like a man said to me uh, this past week, he said, oh, I get it. You mean the world is not rational? Because he had been trying to deal with everything in his life 
including his relationships, rationally. Well, there are a lot of things in, in the world that if you come out with rational in the sense of your left brain, you know, logical, you know, I'm going to deal with our relationship logically now, if then, if then, if then, you know, uh, we're not going to have a very good relationship. It's going to take some right brain stuff. It's going to take some intuition and so forth, some feeling to get things better. So that's a good point. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. There's, um, for reasons that I fully understand, there's a very important culture missing on all of these charts, the Hebrew. Yes. Um, primarily, I, well, one reason it's not a, a polytheological culture, but as I'm looking at that uh, chart of the four different functions, and I think about um, one of my favorite biblical texts, and one of the most confusing and disturbing is the book of Job. Yes. As it's gone... The theory is that it went through several stories yes. orally before finally being put together, some people would say rather inexpertly into one text. And if you look at the figure of the Hebrew God, it goes through those four functions one after the other throughout that story. Are there any people who have done similar comparisons with the various stories in uh, the, the Hebrew cultures looking at cultures that don't have many gods, but one god that seems to shift these functions and, and what that might mean about those. What a wonderful question. I mean, uh, that is one of the, the question is, gee, you know, it's like this Indo-European stuff in Dumasil here doesn't get into uh, Hebrew culture. Well, of course not. You know, it's not Indo-European, right? And so what about those scholars who study uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew culture and Hebrew scriptures, and notice, hey, there's some of this stuff that looks sort of the same as Dumazil is saying. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? Because there are, I understand from my teachers on this, scholars who have looked at uh, some of the Hebrew materials uh, in the light of this theory. And see, they would be anti dumazilian right? Because they would say, if I can prove that this applies to the Hebrew scriptures, Dumazil is wrong. Well, but you see, they're kind of lost in that issue, that issue of whether, whether it's Indo-European or not. What I'm fascinated by is more like what you're saying. Now, your name is William, right? Uh, what I'm fascinated by is I have done some studies of, uh, of, of Hebrew Scripture, too. And to me, it looks for all the world like this schema applies to a lot. And I was not even thinking of the book of Job. I was thinking of the story of David and Solomon. If you study David and Solomon, in fact, uh, tomorrow remind me to go into that some because uh, uh, in terms of transgressions, I hope we get that a little bit this afternoon, but see, in this tradition, according to this form of scholarship, these scholars have noted that moral and spiritual and ethical transgressions are parsed out according to the functions. And not only that, punishments are parsed out and differentiate it according to the different functions. And, for example, in the story of King David, and I, here again I'm indebted to Professor Miller, uh, the king, this is David and Solomon, the king must not be an idolater. Number one. That's the first function. The king, I mean, the king uh, must not use force inappropriately must not do murder number two second function the king must not engage in sexuality inappropriately third function the story of David and Solomon if you read it through this theory would be a teaching story about the ethics of kingship and teaching by failures, not by positive example. Uh, Solomon, in building the temple, according to my friend Professor Miller, Solomon uh, becomes open to idolatry. The false gods, the, the temple gets too much idealization, as I would put it from my previous workshop. Uh, force is used incorrectly in the murder of Uriah, the Hittite Bathsheba's husband, and the Involvement with Bathsheba itself is the third function, transgression. So, uh, wow. Uh, to me, you know, I sat down recently with uh, this dynamic young uh, Hebrew scholar at uh, Chicago Theological Seminary, uh, Ken Stone. And I said, Ken, I know you're awfully busy. 
but I would love to talk with you about whether you know any of the literature on people who've tried to apply Dumazil's theories to the Hebrew Scriptures. And uh, he had heard of that, but that's not been one of his uh, areas of scholarship. But see, now that's a that in itself. Now you'd have to say Dumazil was wrong about the limiting of the theory, and that's where I stand. I think I think it's not Indo-European. I think it is structural. But uh, Dumazil did not. Yeah, go ahead. There were several opportunities for influence to be uh, exchanged. Um, in into the, the, into the, the Hebrews. With the Hebrews. Yes. Indo, for example, uh, the in, Indo-Europeans in about 1800 B.C. with chariots defeated the dynasties of Egypt, the first time Egypt fell. And they ruled Egypt for about 300 years, uh, vastly influencing that whole part of the Mediterranean. Right. Uh, secondly, uh, you have to remember the Hebrews spent a considerable amount of time in exile in Babylon, Babylonia, about the same time that Zoroaster was attempting a reform of the proto-Indo-European uh, religion into one of forces of good versus evil. And there are a number of theories relating to Zoroaster's influence on the Hebrew religion. Bill is giving a little summary uh, that there are some ways that you can argue with Dumazil that the presence of this tripartition in Hebrew scriptures, if it can be demonstrated to be there, is there because of historical influences that can be traced. Uh, this is actually Professor Miller's point of view. He says uh, he would, uh, I don't want to uh, claim that this is exactly what he said, but he said uh, there is some that, that you could argue that, that, that the, the uh, interaction with the Philistines um, could have been a, a, a medium, a channel, through which some of this Indo-European uh, uh, forms got in. But you see, here's, here's my tack on that. If, you, if you're going to do a diffusionist thing, fine, I mean, it's fine. But if you're going to do a Jungian thing, the way you approach is not that. You say, given the assumption of this theory that this is present in some form everywhere, let's look at the data and see if you could argue that. In other words, you confuse the research issue by substituting one theory for the other. What, what, what we'll talk about tomorrow is what happens when you get clear about arguing a Jungian point of view, and then you scan this data again without the diffusionist assumptions. I mean, you can argue it both ways. And a, and a very dyed-in-the-wool dedicated diffusionist is never going to agree with a Jungian point of view, no matter what evidence you give them. See, I mean, so, uh, but in any case, there's no doubt about it. The Zoroastrian influence on the Pharisees, for example, coming into uh, the Hebrew tradition that way and then into Christianity through the, uh, potentially through the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, uh, the uh, I mean, you can argue it historically. There's no question about that, Bill. Yes? Museal arguing that this is that this model or that the these three functions are unique to the Indo European yes. or he's saying this is all I'm looking at. No, he see if you're if his basic well, it would be both. A, a scholarly comp out used by all scholars. If they're smart. Because if you get to know if you analyze these scholars, you get to know them, they're terrified of their flanks and their back. And they, they are going to be, unless they're really tenured, and, and, and they really uh, have got a lot of self-esteem so that being attacked and ridiculed does not affect them too much, they will be extremely timid about asserting their theories very, without humongous documentations of every little word in the, in the footnotes. And so Dumazil would have tremendous interest in saying, this is what I'm studying. I mean, there would be pressure on him to say that. And then secondly, it would be, uh, say, yeah, this is Indo-European. Because if I say it's Indo-European, then all I have to do is focus on those cultures which are Indo-European. I don't have to know everything. But if you're a grandiose Jungian or some other kind of structuralist, then you have to get out and play with people that have all kinds of data you do not know. That's what we're doing today uh, and tomorrow. No indication that he, that he did that and he looked at some other things and then arrived... Oh yes. Oh no. Oh yes. He he in, in, in his scholarship, he is he will argue that this is Indo-European. This is a distinct ideology, and you trace this distinct ideology from these sources, and they spread out this way across these cultures uh, that were were predecessors to modern Europe. 
true structuralist, this is a cognitive argument, that the mind has is, is really got these structures, and it relates to Chomsky's lin linguistics and other people who have done this uh, patterns in linguistics and so on. Uh, but, see what's exciting. I mean, just look at the way that this stuff opens up future research. Just exactly like William said. I mean, I have said to, to Ken Stone at CTS and to Professor Miller, I've said I would love to have some money for a mini conference symposium in which we bring together uh, some people that are willing, in spite of the political incorrectness of looking at Dumazil now, to look at Dumazil and just take Dumazil's uh, theory and then apply it to what data we know about in Hebrew scriptures and just see if there's any way you could argue it. Whether whether a particular scholar would argue that or not, that's not the scientific question. The scientific question is if you take this theory, see that's the way you do science. You take a theory and then you look at data. And the data either encourages you to continue developing the theory or the data discourages you from continuing to work with that theory. It doesn't, you know, one particular set of data may not cause you to, to stop research but it will enable you to ask new questions. For example, the whole issue about, well, what about these gods that are not single-function gods, or these goddesses that are not single-function gods? Doesn't that ruin his theory? And Littleton kind of Littleton kind of thinks that that's one of the weaknesses in Dumasil's theory, that idea of those synthetic gods. I don't think that. If, I think if you understand integration, problems of integration in the self, uh, it's easy to understand why there would have to be synthetic function gods to sandwich the splitting. Think about the formation of self-structure. A personality without energies going into synthesis is just constantly fragmenting at a borderline. See, I mean, a uh, personality that's got energy libido going into integration that is not tied up in conflict, that is the formation of a nuclear self. That's the formation of an integrating self. So, so it's just, the thing that I want you to see here, though, is just what incredible possibilities for generating further research exist in this. You don't have to agree with Dumazil. But one thing to do would be what William is saying. Hey, let's get a bunch of those Hebrew scholars together and let's present Dumazil's theory and say, now, if you were going to argue that you could use Dumazil in interpreting the Hebrew scriptures, what evidence could you amass, amass, whether you agree with it or not? That would be fun. That would be exciting. Uh, and it can be done in every other region. You know, what about South American culture? Because I clue you. If you look at South American cultures, you can see a lot of this too. You can look at uh, a lot of different cultures from different places, and you can see these. You can look at uh, Native American cultures and pick up these things. So, other questions or comments? Yes, maybe. I'm going to raise an um, issue that I'd like first to keep in mind. Okay. As far as I can tell, the Proto-Europeans had almost no goddesses. The few they had related to natural phenomena, the dawn, the river, the Danube, the Denver River. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, here's the little grenade I'm offering. Oh, there is almost no feminine aspects in the Proto-Indo-European yeah. ideology. And most people do not even, so only I think maybe one of these pages includes Greece with its pantheon as part of this because the, the pantheon of Greece is so very different from this. Now, what people have tried to explain this by is, is that as Indo-Europeans came in, basically there was a pocket of old European goddess culture, goddess culture on Crete. And it wasn't uh, destroyed until about 1200 BC. At that time, that's when basically Athena, who essentially is very, very closely tied to the goddess, the goddess of old Europe, Athena then became incorporated into the Greek pantheon, the, the, the Greek at that time being Indo-European, and in order to preserve her statue, Athena has all three functions. And there is a reason I'm this and so they, she has sovereignty. She's the patron deity of Athens. See. Uh, she has four, she has fertility. And they're thinking that that's perhaps one read way that they maintain the goddess in that pantheon by giving her those three functions. Plus, she was a virgin. She was not subjugated to any male god. And so, yes, on one hand, these are, are probably structural. 
but as our own psyches are, they're perhaps a re unbalanced or a reflection of yeah. somewhat unbalanced. Well, see, that whole question you're raising, he's raising the question about, for example, just taking Athena and taking the shift from uh, matriarchal culture to patriarchal culture as an issue, as a research issue. Now, that is a very important issue because, you see, there are a lot of folks that think that the rise of Indo-European culture was really the beginning of the end with regard to humanity. And, and let me just finish this and, and then show how it's related to what Bill is saying. You see, I mean, not long ago, my wife and I, um, Margaret and I were in um, Turkey tracing that pre-European, uh, pre-Greek, pre-Indo-European uh, kind of, uh, of uh, embodiment of Athena who, see, in Greek culture, she gets identified with warrior virtues more. But in Turkey, prior to that prior to that later development, later delineation, such as you see in Bolin's work, uh, she carried a lot more uh, of these functions. If you look at the Athena, of, uh, this, this, this Athena, this Turkish Athena, my wife has it in her consulting room. I mean, she's covered with, with what looked like either eggs or breasts. She is not, she is, she is not in the stereotypical uh, uh, image of the uh, the uh, second function goddess, as uh, if you read Scott Lilton's book, there's a, there's a tendency to associate her a lot of the time with the second function. So, in other words, this is a real interesting question. What I would, we're getting ahead, but remind me to come back to this tomorrow. I want to talk about the relationship between the war of the functions and splitting in the psyche. And I want to talk about the, potent, the way to potentially think about the way that social stratification according to these energies is a is an expression of splitting it's not progress I would argue that prior to this form you didn't farm out the functions to different people in in uh, earlier cultures it could be argued that very likely that there was not this kind of role differentiation going with archetypal energies now let me say why that's significant what happens to human beings when they, in idealizing projections, form out, farm out the sovereignty function to government. What happens to human beings when they, through an idealization, a regressive idealization, farm out the warrior function to the police? What happens to human beings when they farm out the lover projection in a pathological idealization to a movie star, Marilyn Monroe or something, uh, or to a particular group of people uh, who are uh, branded with uh, racist uh, stereotypes and seem to carry third function traits. What happens to human beings when instead of seeing these functions as building blocks of human being that must be taken, that must be integrated in every person, what happens when the magician function is farmed out to professors? And you have ordinary men and women who are taught by the culture that they're stupid. They are not to be educated. You follow me? I would argue in response, and you're anticipating my discussion tomorrow, but I, I would argue that, uh, that this creation of a separate military and the rigidification of that, ossification of that into the Pentagon, this is not progress. Uh, what we've got is a massive, extremely demonic splitting of archetypal energies of the human turned into role differentiation and even social stratification, which are a mark of a failure in integration in the human, uh, in human being, not progress. And that would fit, essentially, the kind of thing that Bill is bringing up. And uh, that requires in reflection. And this is what I want us to reflect about tomorrow in terms of implications. What if, see, tomorrow I want us to talk, what if you don't, you don't read this like Dumasil reads it. But what if you take the data and you take a Jungian archetypal point of view? What if this is about building blocks of human being and not just Indo-European social stratification? And what if, Indo what if the Hindu caste system is really an expression of splitting that we continue today in the way in which uh, we really... In many ways, we recapitulate. We like to think we're superior to the Hindus. And we like to think we don't do the same thing they did with social stratification. 
But I'm going to suggest to you tomorrow we do very much the same thing with regard to splitting and social stratification along archetypal lines. So, so you're anticipating, but I want us to come back to this and talk about it because, uh, because it is a really important question um, that you need to ask. What happens when these archetypal energies get projected on other people and other people are expected to carry them for us? Is that a good thing? I don't think so. Yes. Go ahead. Janini gave me a couple of years ago called The Chalice and the Blade. Mm -hmm. Is that when you were talking about some of these issues? That that, that book with the uh, yeah. What's her name? What's her name? Renee. Renee. Uh, I can't remember. It's a fabulous book. Eisler. Uh, Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade. <clears throat> yeah. See, for a long time I would really have panned that book, but there is a sense in which, if you think along the lines we're thinking about here, that would that book does get at some of this issue. That in fact. Uh, the kind of violent acting out of male aggression that we have seen for so long in uh, culture, that, that, uh, that may have been exacerbated by certain uh, historical developments. For example, uh, tomorrow we should talk about this. What happens, see, as long as you're in small groups and you can have a kind of an indigenous tribal culture, uh, say you do not have the means of production that's necessary to develop a city-state yet, so you maintain smaller groups, and um, there is less of a press to social differentiation of archetypal energies, although there is some, but there's less for press, for example, to not have every person carry some responsibilities on all these fronts. Uh, in tribal indigenous cultures, uh, while there is some differentiation of role and so on, uh, there, is a, there is a sense in which there is less rigid role differentiation uh, than, uh, than we see in, uh, in these Indo-European Indo forms. So the question I would have is uh, when technology got to the point where you could have adequate surpluses to create city-states and then you start building, you start getting, you know, there's a lot of evidence that our species can maintain a sense of empathy and connection only in groups uh, less than 200, really. Um, that's why, for example, a lot of people think that the existence of small churches is a, is a, is sort of a, you know not big churches but small churches you know 150 people in them something like that 200 that that's some mark of not being able to have adequate evangelism or something uh, when in fact it may reflect uh, some of very spe species specific things that is to say uh, there's evidence that the that the ape that we are the primate that we are cannot maintain a sense of connection on an empathic level with groups when they go beyond a certain point. When once, once the size of the group gets beyond a certain point, there's evidence that we become very violent and predatory. So uh, it's an interesting thing that you bring up. But Eisler's book does touch on this thing about, well, isn't it true that there's more violence now once that warrior function gets so pronounced? See, my argument would be, and we come back to this tomorrow, the, uh, the, the warrior function has always been there. But in this particular form of culture that we're studying here it gets separated out and uh, and you get what we have in the United States now you know a lot of your tax money is spent uh, training killers who have absolutely no humane values whatsoever most Americans don't know this but if you study the militaries I have you will find that vast amounts of funds are go into training professional killers that have absolutely no human values whatever and uh, and that is very similar uh, to uh, that kind of Eisner argument. That once this thing splits off and starts war chariots, once you got war chariots, uh, the game changes. So I'll, we'll come back to that tomorrow. Other comments and questions? Yeah. When you talk about dual sovereignty, yes. uh, the Catholic Church is the worst for dual sovereignty. Yeah. This Pope doesn't acknowledge women at all. I mean, I taught the major religions, and I thought Jesus wouldn't recognize his church today. It's all, uh, you know, power, power over other people. Yeah, yeah. And you know, somebody was commenting, um, the Pope has been visiting Castro, and I was listening to NPR. And uh, the question was about um, this whole sovereignty issue in the, uh, in the Roman Church. And... Um, 
uh, they were commenting that uh, the the domination agendas of Castro and uh, the Pope, while they are differently expressed in different places, there is a lot of domination energy there. And what we want to do when we think about this dual sovereignty, what I want to do tomorrow is to say that uh, that uh, as long as the magical function is used for domination instead of opposition to the king function, you you still have a, a more regressive expression of these energies. The very having of dual sovereignty is the bifurcation of power. And so that's a step in the right direction. But what I did not realize, and I have realized more clearly now since I've been studying this material. See, I when I when I was working on this earlier on, I thought that sovereignty was just the king or queen. But after studying this material, as we'll get into more tomorrow, I realize that actually adequate sovereignty requires a balance of powers between the king and somebody who's not monarchical. And there we are back to the Hebrew Scriptures. Because if you look at the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, a lot of the Bible scholars are fascinated with the fact that in the Hebrew Scriptures there is this one strand which is pro-monarchy. And there's this distinct strand that's anti-monarchy. And a lot of the scholars believe that's sort of accidental. Somebody just kind of pasted these things together. And that's just the way it turned out. But after studying this material, I have said to my biblical scholar friends, I don't think that's accidental. I think somebody understood all this stuff, and they understood that if you put in just the monarchical, you would have tyranny. And if you put in just the prophetic, you would have chaos. And so what you have to do is to have a dynamic tension built into the system between the yes and the no, the yes of power and the no to power. That's what democracy is about. Well, that's the only way you can have a democracy that's actual democracy is to have a, a, a split sovereignty, a, a, a balance of powers. And so yeah, that's another interesting research question. Could it be argued, with, in, in terms of scholarship of the Bible, could it be argued that those different traditions are not merely artificial creations by redactors, but that whoever was working on those texts intended for those traditions not to be resolved, to represent the truth? Because if, if, you, if you take the implications of this theory that we're looking at, uh, the argument would be that you cannot have a, a valid sovereignty if it's singular. So uh, I think that's a fascinating issue. Other comments or questions? Yeah. I think the, the woman is a balance for the man. Oh, certainly. And the yes, yes, indeed. In fact, that's why I argue that. Uh, Even though their functions are different, they. Are. Yes, yes. I think it's important. <clears throat> say, for example, that queen images balance king images. But I think it's also important to realize that all these polarities that you also need. Uh, uh, See, the queen and the king represent, as we'll get into tomorrow, they represent cosmos formation. They represent forming a world and, and building a realm. But uh, here's where the deconstructionists have a place. Here's where the post-structuralists have a place. You have to have, against either queens or kings, you have to have somebody that says no to their power. You have to have a trickster function that's a healthy trickster function. Uh, we call it in the Hebrew scriptures, we call it the prophet. The prophet who says, thou art the man who did this unjust thing. So uh, so I think, yes, the female is a balance to these male images, and as we see my theory tomorrow, you'll see it. I think it's structural. And uh, But also, uh, if you take this theory seriously, I would argue probably the, the queen is no more egalitarian than the king, and uh, her power needs to be balanced by an anti-queen power. Uh, just like um, you think of any any daughter that's been trying to rebel against her mother for her own liberation, uh, that's probably a lot of truth in that.